Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Teaching Technology Skills by Design by Animation and Context. My name is Gary Moore, otherwise known as Design. I know you're not supposed to read, have a lot of text, but well, you can read that because it's important. It gives the background to how the, uh, the design part. Uh, we have a class called Teach, uh, Technology and the Practice of Law. And that was started in the spring of 2014 by Dr. Greg Adams and myself. And the history of it was this. Uh, I've been here now nearly seven years with the University of South Carolina School of Law. When I had my second interview here, Dr. Adams, Greg, and his R, was my chaperone. And towards the end of the day, um, when we uh, were done, you know, I was there for a day and a half, uh, we had a talk. It was over a beer, thirsty fellow, it must have been. Uh, and he talked about his vision about having a class uh, teaching uh, lawyers to how to be proficient in technology. It was his experience that not just students, but also attorneys were not proficient in technology, and that was really important. Uh, it's funny, Greg makes a comment here about students not knowing how to deal with email safely, and there's definitely re statistical reasons for it. So this is not just anecdotal. Um, one other thing I want to note, when I first started here, um, first few months, uh, Pamela Melton, who's a former associate director here, she talked to me and she knew a lot of attorneys, she said, the number one thing uh, they said, tell me and partners is that their associates do not know word of styles. So we'll talk about that more in a second. But you can see here, you would think millennials know how to protect, you know, use technology and, and be, uh, be secure with their email and passwords. They're not. In fact, they're the worst. Yes? Can we define millennials? Because my understanding is the current ones in law school are no longer millennials, so I just want to make sure we're using a Well, based on this survey, which was last year, 18 to 34 is considered millennials. And there's been other statistics. Um, the OECD back in a few years ago, when I guess millennials were still considered 18 to 34, um, millennials did the worst on technology skills. And also uh, Casey Flaherty, who was formerly a preservist and now is at Baker McKenzie, also when he did his legal tech assessments, 33%. Own knew the, the basics of Word, which is cut and paste, track changes, things like that. So, and I forgot to start my time, but that was good. So, that was one of the things that we saw. We also had other statistics. We did a 2000, this was actually two years after we started the class. We had a consultant survey, you know, Kennedy and Kennedy come in and do some work for us. And one of the most interesting statistics were, was the, those right there that more than a third need e-discovery boot camp, which you know, their attorneys would like to see them do that, and a third would like to see them doing legal technology and legal services. So we had statistics to actually prove that there was a need for technology proficiency in teaching that in class. Um, so we started that in spring of 2014, and we wanted to say about also talking about being proficient, but also using it competently, which is a lot of the bar rules, and protecting confidentiality, which is a lot of the bar rules as well. And so our syllabus is up on the class caster, so you can take a look at it. And uh, we have it updated for this right. So what we tried to do was try to um, really encompass everything you could possibly do in 13. And you'll see one thing here. Um, we have one class cancels due to snow. So this is from spring 2018. We actually did a schedule on that. Snow was, if you remember 2018, we were supposed to have a snowstorm. For those of you here, nothing ever panned out. There was no snow. There was nothing. Yeah, we canceled snow. So. In the south, it snows. So half the class is taught by Greg and myself. And the other half is guest speakers. You'll also notice that one of the things that we did is you'll see a thing here that says IT seminar. So we had a legal tech seminar series that we have, that I oversee started four years ago and it's going to be back up again in fall. We started fall 2015 and we had it on Thursday morning. We, we had first tried to do it at lunchtime, 
but we also wanted to offer CLE credit to attorneys. So we ended up doing, and it turns out it's the perfect time for an attorney. We just did a survey, and they like Thursday mornings the best. Um, so we do a one-hour CLE on how technology affects the law. We've had many speakers. We had Ed Walters here talking about fast case, but not really about cast. <coughs> what he considers malpractice, not using data analytics. So if you were at uh, um, Ben Chapman's great talk in analytics that very well with me. So we tried to cover everything that we thought was important to technology proficiency. So we did some skills base with, you know, uh, we do the LTAs. We were an early adopter in Andy Perlman's LTAs when he was at Suffolk. And then we morphed with Fresertis uh, when they built a more advanced and what we thought was a better solution for uh, audios and assessments. We cover encryption, we cover passwords, we cover um, um, artificial intelligence, we also cover e-discovery, uh, you know, experts, and so we brought in a lot of people. So our, when we had our classes on Thursday mornings, thir you know, we had an 8 to 10, from 8 to 9, and we'd have Thursday, Wednesday, and Thursday. The Thursday class, when we had a legal tech seminar, they would just come to the seminar, and they would show up. And um, it worked out really well. And um, our seminars have been very useful. Um, and it's one of the things you'll see at the end of my slide presentation is that we got really good feedback from having guest speakers. So it wasn't, you, know, you had people actually using technology in their field like Thomas Pendarvis, um, e-filing, that's Jason Boberts from the South Carolina State Supreme Court, um, Judge Few, Justice Few of the Supreme Court on his pro bono software, and so it, that resonated a lot more with the students than just us talking. So, and this is our Legal Tech Seminar Series, you can find that on our website. So, one of the things we had to address is technology proficiency. One of the LTAs is acronyms. And it so happens that one of the classes we do in the semester is me going through the training module of the LTA and showing them how to properly use Acrobat PDF. So the thing is, you're fighting a lot of things, perceptions, about how difficult Acrobat is, uh, which is not true. And so nothing was more timely than the Paul Manafort uh, <laughs> fiasco. So they had an expert on um, MSNBC. I happened to be watching early in the morning, riding my stationary bike, when I heard watch this and was not pleased. That he was right about the diagnosis, but the treatment, not so much. Lead us to what many people have suspected, which is that perhaps the Trump campaign uh, there was a conspiracy to give the Russian uh, government information so the GRU could target certain areas in you know, swing states that could make a difference in the election. In a number of different theories of connection between the campaign and Russia, this fulfills the theory that uh, Manafort may have been offering for sale access to the campaign in exchange for debt forgiveness or whatever else he needed on his end. But it certainly suggests uh, a quid pro quo of some kind, any kind of communication that suggested that it might give the Russians some advantage or valuable information. Information is currency in this world of election and campaign uh, uh, success and everything else. So you have a connection like this between the Russians strongly suggests one of the theories of liability in the Manafort case. Danny, procedural question hmm. before my substantive question. How does this happen? How does Manafort's team present publicly a document that's unredacted? I can diagnose this problem, okay, got and it. it's a product of just the last 10 years. As courts have increasingly become e-filing courts, many documents never even become paper. They're created and live entirely. They go from Microsoft Word to PDF, and lawyers like me, we live in the world of PDF. And in the old days, lawyers would physically take a black pen and redact by hand, or 
or they'd use black tape. That's a very effective mm -hmm. system because once you scan it, there's no text to read at all on the document. But nowadays, when you publish a PDF, the system has a redaction feature, but it's cumbersome, it's hard to find, it's multi-click, mm -hmm. it's irritating. An easier, lazier fix is using the highlight feature, set it to black, and then it looks exactly like a redaction. But the problem with that is, underneath that black highlighter is the text, and you've redacted really nothing. And that's what uh. I suspect happened with these PDF documents. And it's a product of uh, some of the uh, old school lawyers are just l struggling to catch up and learn how PDFs work and how to use them. This may have been a, mm. a fix that went unnoticed by the team and just a really big gaffe. Do you <laughs> so you were all laughing because, you know, his treatment is completely untrue. How many of you use Adobe Acrobat and have used the redaction feature? You all know it. You click in the tools bar and type redact. <laughs> <laughs> so we do the LTA and I do the training module PDF. One of the things is the redact and I show them <coughs> how easy it is to redact. Well, also, when we talk about the pop-up talk, that's when it was timely. I did a pop-up talk on Redact. Um, so this is the perception you have to fight because, and this is helps in this class, in the technology practice law. They're learning how to use Acrobat proficiently. And another thing, uh, Manafort is, the, that whole thing, they, that was the gift to how not to use technology properly. The reason he got in trouble in the first place, he didn't know how to convert it. Word to PDF, and and and, didn't, and that's how he messed up all of his taxes, you know, the, the finances and all that. So he's just a gift that keeps on giving on how to use technology. <laughs> so one of the things we had for the class, uh, we required for the class, was that they had to do a binder of technology articles. They had to research. We had 13 weeks. They had to do three articles a week, so that results in a binder of 39 articles. And the subjects they came up with were great. I mean, especially this semester. I had law review articles. I had, uh, we had um, government reports. We had, you know, some really great things. Um, this was talking about medical legal partnerships. We happen to have a medical legal partnership here in the School of Law, the Champs Clinic. So there were some other really great things. There was blockchain. There was GDPR, which was timely. Women in cybersecurity, which I thought was great. That's something that the research and talent a lot. So we had some really, really well, and then also, can you sue a mal an algorithm for malpractice? I mean, that's timely. About, you know, you know, the inequalities and some software biases in the algorithms. So it was really, they did a really good job this semester. One student in particular, Will Murdaugh, when he was doing his binder, found what he thought was going to be a really great article on non-consensual pornography. It turned out to be an NPR podcast. So he was looking, decided to find an article based on the, the uh, person having Kerry Goldberg and C.A. Goldberg in New York. So he found this article. Well, I knew about the article. I knew about the article nearly three years ago. Um, C.A. Goldberg is, they, they have clients in New York where they fight for non-consensual pornography, you know, victims of revenge porn and all that. And it was the subject of the New Yorker article and when I first read it, I was like, I've got to get these guys out here, down here. Because it turns out there's two states, there's a lot of states that have laws against non-consensual pornography. Two that don't. One, surprisingly, is New York, and another one is South Carolina. So I actually had Adam Massey come down here and speak. And he actually talked to a state rep afterwards. So Adam did a great job. I got Adam in touch with Will. And so, you know, and Will is very interested in, in having a technology law career. So that's the benefit of this class is that, you, you know, based on some research, I was able to make a connection for him. And it was a very useful connection. And it's a great, it's a, Adam did a wonderful job in his, in, his, in his talk. So statistics matter, okay? And the stats are really important. And this is what students are happy, you know, are, I don't say happy, but much more you know, comfortable using Word and Excel and, and PDF afterwards. You can see the stats before the LTAs and then afterwards. And I think that's really, really important because, um, I mean, I can tell you, and not even anecdotal, it's proof. One of our students from two years ago, Creighton Seniors, who I know, I think both of you know, um, 
actually emailed us and said, I am using word styles and now I know word styles in my firm. I am saving a ton of time. It has helped me so much. And that's the kind of feedback you want to have. Um, I'll let you guys read these. You know, this is the other one with tax, but these are um, quotes from our evaluations. And I think the one thing that I really enjoyed was hearing about the guest speakers and the, the, the secret service. And there's really, you know, it really resonates when you hear an expert in security like the secret service. They do a lot of work with cybersecurity. And especially when one, you get an agent who's talking about a business email compromise and saying, don't email the that a secret service agent actually do that. It's kind of neat when they got a kick out of that. I did. I don't know about you guys. Um, anyway, a lot of the talk is that they think the class is really important. They think a lot of it should be in the 1L practice. That's you know 1L. Um, uh, some of your year. That's something we have to look into. Um, the most important feedback that I think is important is getting feedback from a student that's been in the class and actually taken what he's learned and decided to make a career out of it. Uh, David Pace, uh, was a 2016 alum of the school, he very much interested in technology law. Not only did he take our class, he also took uh, Law Didn't Be Possible, another class I helped up with profile. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Brian Walker-Smith. So I'm going to finish on David talking about how important um, what technology that students need to know and how it's helped them. So, um, without a doubt, be proficient in word styles, like Microsoft Word styles, be proficient in Excel, um, be proficient in Adobe as well. Those are, I think those should be your three core baseline proficiencies. Um, are you guys still doing the uh, that class where you have to take the tests? Yes, the LTAs. In those? Yes, the LTAs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So don't take that take that very seriously. If it's not something that you're just going to use to like you know get through the class. Under having a real core understanding and knowledge of that is going to be very very very, very valuable in practice. Um, it cuts down the wasted not a little time that you're going to be on, or say you even try to build all that time, probably get flashed anyways. And so like, one thing in practice is you want to be as efficient as possible in billing, so that way you guys can capture, you know, spend less hours in the office. And understanding those through, you know, Office, Adobe, and um, yeah, yeah, basically those, those two things. Just, it, helps out so much. And I guarantee you, if you guys are really good at it, you guys are going to be the go-to person in the office of like, hey, I have to do this. Can, you're really good at it. Can you help me out? And it's it's good to be that guy because that means that, that or girl, because that means that you're you know, driving value um, or that you're valuable to your firm in immediate way. Um, and it's, it's very, very, very important. Um, another thing is I would try to become at least familiar with at least one hosting um, platform, whether it be a platform like Disco or Relativity. Um, yep. That would mean people to Relativity. Like, I can give you guys access to that. It's, uh, it's really, really important to kind of understand at least at a high level of what it is and what you're trying to do because um, it's a really valuable tool. And as it becomes more and more popular, and it already is extremely popular and used a ton, but just having that understanding of that technology really does go a long way in helping you become more efficient um, with your work. David actually will practice. That relativity had a free site license for law schools. He clued me in on that. So now we have agreement. How many people didn't know that? Okay, good number of you didn't know that. Relativity has a free site license for law school. And I found out it due to David Pace. And that's just a benefit for our students, just right then and there. He's in the legal field and he's also helping us out. That's all I got to say.
Thank you. Uh, thank you to Gary. Uh, my name is Amy Mulligan. I am the context in our um, three-word presentation. Context was the one word that many of you, of you to this session. Uh, I teach legal research analysis and writing. I co-teach it with Eve. I teach the writing portion of it. And as a writing teacher, I always tell my students, you bury the bad stuff or the boring stuff in the middle. So uh, that's why context, I think, is in the middle. I'm not really sure. Uh, and we'll be talking about Microsoft Word in particular, which there's probably not a more um, or a less exciting subject to talk about other than grammar. So be glad that I'm not talking to you about grammar today, but I'm talking to you about um, Microsoft Word. So last summer, I created this guide that you see behind me. We'll look at the specifics in just a few minutes. But it's Microsoft Word Fundamentals for Efficient Lawyers and Law Students. That title is a mouthful. It was my working title that just never got changed. So if anybody has any witty titles that they want to throw at me later uh, in the session, I'm glad to take that non-proprietary information um, and, and steal it for, um, for our guide. So. What these guides do, or what I fundamental skills that I think my students in the first year need to complete their documents on Word. They're digestible, they're clean, I hope that they're easy to use. Um, in, addition, they include some, in addition, they include some advanced skills in there as well that hopefully students will refer back to um, as they continue through their legal education. Additionally, lawyers within our state will refer to this guide too uh, because not everyone is, is as proficient with Word as we would like them to be. Uh, so why the tutorials? Why did I spend my summer vacation? Um, working with Word. So this morning you heard our dean give you a very warm welcome. And during that welcome, he talked a lot about technology. And that wasn't just lip service. So one of the first things that our dean did when he became dean was hire this dean. Uh, and Gary has been instrumental in bringing technology not only into this building, but into our curriculum. So that's how important technology is to our dean. So when we moved into this building just two years ago, uh, he challenged the faculty. He said, we've got this wonderful building, it has this, uh, this technology integrated into the classrooms, and the legal profession is an evolving technology environment. And we need to be bringing those things to our students, so you as faculty need to figure out not only how to integrate technology into your teaching, but to teach about technology. And I thought, oh, good God, what do I do? I, I teach, I use words. I don't use much of anything else. Eve's the lucky one. She gets to use technology with our students on a, a, a class basis. Um, so just about that time, one of the wonderful things that Dean Gary Moore did was he got Casey Flaherty to video conference with us which was a great experience. We may have been in this classroom, actually. Um, so Casey's big head was I didn't know all that much about the legal tech audit. So I was really impressed to see that that service was out there and that was helping lawyers to be more effective and efficient. I thought, OK, word. That's my thing. That's what I need to do. And I had been struggling for many years because I knew that it was those skills were things that I needed, my students needed to learn. I didn't know how to do it, um, particularly within the context of the classroom environment. Um, so two, as you all know, and we've been talking about already <laughs> during these sessions, we deal with digital natives. They know they're comfortable with technology. But just because they're comfortable with it doesn't mean they know how to use it. You all have all seen students struggle with Microsoft Word. I'm sure you have all struggled with Microsoft Word a little bit, too. It's not intuitive, as Casey Flaherty has said. Putting in the words is intuitive, but how to make it function efficiently is not all of that intuitive. Um, and in fact, as Gary mentioned earlier, our law students barely know the basics of how to make that work. So when I was trying to figure out what I wanted the content of this guide to be, 
I, I've looked around a lot. Um, I looked at the, um, the legal tech audit. I talked to my legal writing colleagues. What skills do you think your students need um, to navigate more through your class? Um, how about my law faculty colleagues? What did they see? The law librarians were invaluable, and of course our academic technology because you folks deal with that um, on a daily basis and working with students. Um, so once I kind of got this list of the <coughs> things that I wanted to include in my, um, in my guides, I then had to think very carefully about what form I wanted it to take. <coughs> Because for me, it was really important that students were delivered these um, guides within the context in which they would be useful. <laughs> Our students have divided attention. They've got a thousand different things going on. And it is not relevant to them until it is relevant to them. So I wanted to figure out how to deliver these things to them when it was going to be most useful to them and they were most likely to use it. Uh, so again, I talked to academic technology, I talked to librarians, Erin Glenn in particular was so helpful um, in helping me use LibGuides. And Erin, you're talking about LibGuides soon, all right. Uh, so I'll plug for his session a little later today. Oh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, I looked at similar resources. Shout out to Debbie Ginsburg if she's in here. Chicago Kent um, has a really great comprehensive guide with lots of self-generated content in it. Um, and then I went to the Beast, which was uh, Microsoft, to see how they were handling um, these skills as well. And I collected all of this and then created the guide. So we will look at this um, very quickly, I hope. But this is the live site. Um, and this is the home landing page that you come to um, that just provides some information. But this is essentially a libguide. And I have it organized on the left hand side by broad topic. So for example, basic formatting, you can click into it um, and then go into particular lessons. Um, that I'm, I'm hoping to address. And as you will notice, I have it formatted in terms of a problem and how it is resolved. Because I want students to understand that this is a way that they can um, erase a problem, essentially. This is just not information that is being thrown at them. Um, so I certainly can go through here and figure out how to do, um, how to do some of these skills. So then my challenge became, okay, I've got this guide. There's a lot to it. I spent summer doing it. Tobias Brodier and IT also helped me with that. So how do I deliver it? So this is the first page of my mine and, um, Eve's syllabus, which is 18 pages long. It's lengthy. Uh, as you can see, for the writing part of the class, I assigned three textbooks. Eve um, and the other research folks have managed to create their own online textbook, so that at least gives our students a little relief. But they've got four sources for our class. If I just said, hey, here, here's a guide, go read it, do you think they're going to do that? No. Word's boring. And they've got other things to do with their time. Um, so I thought really hard about how to deliver this to you. I still don't know that I've arrived at the most helpful way to do it, but this is what I got. Word Wednesday. So every Wednesday during portions of the class that I would teach, I would have a, um, I would assign, not assign, allocate a particular part of the word guide to the student based on what we were doing that week so that it would be most relevant. So for example, uh, for September 19th, shortcut keys for symbols and auto format um, override. So that was a week in which they were writing a memo and have to put in citations. So they would have to know how to put in the section symbol and how to do that efficiently. So I came up with this schedule and I thought, okay, now what do I do? If I give this to them, they're going to see it as an assignment that they get no benefit from, allegedly and they're not going to do it or read it or pay much attention to me. So 
what I decided to do is have my tutors send this information. Because I'm the professor, and in the first year, I'm just a meanie. Uh, but the tutors are there to really help them and to move forward their skills. So what the tutors would do, I have two of them, one of them would take the word Wednesday, and they would shoot them an email saying, hey, here's a really great thing for you to take a look at this particular week for this particular reason. And hopefully they went to the guide and they figured out how to integrate those particular concepts. And of course, I would try to reinforce that in class as well. So if I was typing a citation and you know the superscript would go up for fourth, I would go, okay, Control Z, that gets it right down. Let's talk about that, or let's talk about, remind ourselves how we um, do a shortcut key um, to include that section. <coughs> um, so that was really, really helpful. So I haven't really tracked anything to see uh, how effective this was, but I will tell you, I saw lots of light bulbs go off, or I would have students come to my office and tell me um, how they worked through a particular issue in a guide, or that they referred friends to, and. Uh, to the guide to resolve their particular issues. Um, so it's still a work in progress. I'm hoping to tweak the guide a little bit over the summer as well and to add a little bit of content to it. Uh, but that is teaching word in context. And we'll take questions, I think, at the end if you will have any. Thank you, Amy. Um, and I just want to emphasize that all three of these words, design, context, and ambush, were authored by Amy Milligan of the Leader of the Writing Center. Um, I'd like a quick show of hands. Who feels like they don't have enough time in class to teach technology skills to their students? Uh, heard a student say that they can't fit a technology class into their schedule. Who has ever heard students say that they don't have enough time at lunch, you know, if you ever have like a lunch series or any other kind of series, that, that they just can't fit that into their schedule, these, these extra brown bag sessions. This ambush is for you. <laughs> We encountered all kinds of problems like that and thought we can't fit any more into our class in the first year. Only so many people are going to take the technology classes that are so valuable and I wish more people would take Gary's class. Um, so how do we fill in those gaps for those students? Um, surprise! We just want them to see us reaching out to them. We want them to know that we are friendly faces, we are interactive, we will explain technology to them, show technology to them, demo it, help them practice it. It will be enjoyable and fun. Really, this is uh, the goal, is to have them see our friendly faces and know who they can come to uh, when they have questions. And uh, this is not an original idea. Much like Isaac Newton, we did not come up with this ourselves. <laughs> These links are in my slides, and I'll also just click on them for you real quick. This idea came from a presentation at the American Association of Law Libraries in 2017. And for some reason, it doesn't like to come up when I click, but this is what it looks like. Uh, there's a checklist, and then there are two copies of a list of topics. So this is kind of what my basis was when, when I borrowed, didn't steal, I borrowed this idea. Um, and then this is uh, the second link. This is our lib guide once again for how we implemented that lightning lessons concept, but we called it pop-up tech talks. So uh, going back here to the concept was created by AJ Blechner and Heather buy-in for a program like this, let people know that it came from Harvard and it's working out real well for Harvard. <laughs> um, so what the main thing that's different though is the lightning lessons were specifically about research. They were created by the law librarians, they were presented by the law librarians, and the major thing that we did that's different is we expanded it 
including the law library still, but we included legal writing and we included academic technology. And we opened it up to every staff member, faculty member, wherever you are, if technology is involved, and like, is it involved in every area of the law school? I think so. Um, so anyone who was willing was welcome to create their own tech talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to organize my presentation based on that lightning lesson toolkit. And the reason I'm doing that is because they've got some if you want to implement this, what are all the different things you can think about. Um, so I, I recommend going back to them, but what I'm going to tell you about is the specifics that we did. So I'm going to start with that checklist. <laughs> And because we're in a new building, we didn't really know what the traffic patterns were going to be like, right? We could make some guesses, but we wanted to be able to say, is this working? Nope. Okay, change it. Oh, ooh, let's, let's tweak that and, and just be really nimble about it. And again, we're opening up who's going to give these talks and what we're going to talk about past the law library. So then when? What time of day? Where? Which part of the law school? When we're trying to maximize this traffic, there were a lot of things we tried. Take 15 seconds, tell your partner, if you were to do this at your school, where might you try? When and where? 15 seconds, <laughs> 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 There's a very simple email that we send out to anyone who is willing to do a talk. So the first two things are each individual presenter can pick their own time and place. Mm -hmm. And if they change their mind, they can change their mind. Whatever they want to do, they want to do another one, they can do another one. Total freedom. And they can decide, do they want to do a laptop? Do they, do they want to do two laptops? Do they want a big display screen? What do they want to do? What's going to work? Um, requirements. There's got to be a handout. We wanted it electronically so that we could put it in our LibGuide. And we wanted a physical paper handout because that makes it really easy to do number four, assessment. If you know how many handouts you printed, and then you know how many you're left with, that's really easy math, even for us. <laughs> it also um, makes a connection. It makes a connection. Holding that handout is a little bit of uh, psychological pressure <laughs> to take it, um, and to maybe not throw it away instantly, like wait till you're around the corner. <laughs> um, it's also kind of uh, hard to tally the number of interactions, which we also did try to tally uh, just how many people did you talk to, even if they didn't take a handout. But have, has anyone ever tried to like keep track of how many people they're talking? And it's a little challenging. So, so we had both methods, just to kind of see what worked. And the other requirement, the last thing, be reflective. How did it go? What went well? What would you do differently? And that let us all, as we were going through this first semester, spring 19 was our first semester, it let us learn from each other and improve as we went along. So the list of topics from this past semester, how long do y'all think it is? Is this gonna be a surprise? Ambush. <laughs> 15 topics in one semester. Wow. Um, the highlighted topics were ones that were also done by the Harvard Law Library that was their list. So we expanded into other aspects of technology as well. Going back to their toolkit, when you think about your lessons, how short do they need to be? Oh boy, <laughs> we initially said five minutes. If you look at our LibGuide, it still says five minutes. That's a dream. <laughs> Here's how a tech talk typically goes. If, if you're a student, I say, do you know how to exclude a word from your Google search? No. A what? You can do that? Yes. Here's how you do it. You put a minus sign in front of the word. Click, show them. 
wow, that's cool. Take a handout, they're gone. <laughs> Less time than it took you to think of one place and time in your law school <laughs> to do one of these talks. That's how short it is. And you want a timely topic, like Gary mentioned. Do you see the look on this student's face who realizes that he's smarter than Paul Manafort? <laughs> <laughs> and Paul Manafort to three. <laughs> so again, how are you going to display this? What are your handouts going to look like? You can be creative. How are you going to advertise it? Is it going to fit into a standard format for events at your law school? Uh, or is it going to be different in some way? One thing we realized midway through the semester is that when we're standing in the hallway like that, you saw that lobby, right? What did y'all see in that lobby today? Ooh, ooh. Oh, yeah. Vendors. So for students who, especially one else, who don't really recognize our faces, they don't know if we're vendors or employees or professors or who we are, they were a little hesitant because they thought we might be trying to sell them something. This sign right here. So it's in our school color garnet. And every time we had a tech talk, that sign showed up. So it was a signal that we're safe to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> so we all brought different treats. Um, if you know why hers was like more crowded than any of ours, <laughs> it was the word topic. The word oh, it was the word topic. <laughs> um, and you also want to have a hook. So just like I demonstrated, something that's one line that starts with, did you know, have you seen, like however you can uh, attract that interest, that's, that's the number one thing to prep ahead of time. This was on the monitors, like you've seen where it says welcome Cali right now. So this is what we had all semester because we didn't really know what was going to happen. We, you know, we had people scheduling things as we went along, changing the schedule or whatever. So we kept the schedule on our LibGuide, and we have the link right here. Now, do I think anyone actually typed on their phone this? No. No. But they could recognize this, and they could recognize the sign, and <coughs> gradually there was more of a connection being made. So thinking about how to assess this. What are you going to count? Are you going to do a quantitative assessment of some kind? Um, it helps to have helpers. Like I was just talking about that tally of interactions. Like if I'm trying to count the interactions but also like grab people, it just doesn't work that well. And so that's why Amy Milligan had the brilliant idea to involve her tutors. So these are 2L and a 3L who work with her uh, um, as sort of teaching assistants a little bit for the 1L class. And they didn't have enough to do, so here's something for them to do. Um, and, and so they were able to help her manage the demonstration and the muffins, was it muffins? Muffins. Oh, yeah, so you've got to manage the treats and the demonstration and the assessment. It, it two or three people does help. What happens if you run out of handouts? What a lovely problem to have. <laughs> we had that problem multiple times, and we love it every time. Um, even though we kept increasing the number of handouts we brought with us. Um, so it does mess with your numbers a little bit, so you can't get too hung up on those. The qualitative assessment. What are we going to do differently next time? What went well? What could we fix? That was really um, the focus every time. If we had tried to do lunchtime brown bag sessions, do you think we would have gotten that number of interactions or that number of handouts? I don't think so. But I don't have a control group. I don't know. So some of the things we learned from this quantitative assessment. On the left here, this is the number of interactions. This is the student commons. If you hadn't had a tour yet, you might the student area. A lot of them eat lunch there, a lot of them study there, it's supposedly kind of their living room slash computer lab. Uh, initially that was where we thought was kind of the best place. And then the pink is the lobby. So that the lobby is what you've seen in these photos. And we started to realize that we gave out a lot more handouts in the lobby. 
but we had slightly more interactions in the commons. So it gets you thinking about how these different pieces of architecture, like the dean was talking about, the way that architecture affects behavior. We, we did want to have some in-depth discussions uh, with individual students, if we could, right? But then that visibility of everyone walking in the door, taking a handout, that was also really positive. So they're both still in the mix. Timing. I mean, we were assuming lunch time. You've heard me say lunch several times. But what we realized was both interactions and handouts. More in the morning. Who knew? Oops, I've just turned my screen off. There we go. So, um, over the months, so January, February, and March, we did these talks. This is the first time that we did them. Uh, we stopped well before the exam panic sets in. And you can watch on the left interactions. We figured out how to increase them, and then we realized we were losing the quality of the interaction. We were getting the numbers, but not the quality. And so it went back down. But those in March were much deeper conversations where students really wanted to go in depth understanding how to use the software that we were demonstrating. And the handouts kept going up. <coughs> Question. So how did you make that change? You said that you noticed that the quality of the interactions was going down. What did you do to flip that? Right. So what we flipped was we added the helpers. So there's someone there handing the handout, you know, tallying, that sort of thing. Meanwhile, I can continue my interaction while someone else is just grabbing those. So additional people involved. But again, what did we do? We each did different things. Like it was different presenters continuing to throw everything at the wall. What really surprised us was that staff and faculty were interested. We were very intentional as we chose our topics and how to present them, that everything was going to be accessible and understandable to a 1L. And that it would be something they could use right away, and it would be something they could continue to use. So we were that intentional that it would be that basic. And yet we had staff and faculty, especially those walking in through the lobby in the morning who were like, Show me how to do that thing you just did, which was super awesome to see. It surprised us how well that early morning worked. I thought people wouldn't have had their coffee yet. And it surprised us that it was more than just that quick interaction, sometimes even more than a five-minute interaction a few times, just depending on where the interest was. Next steps. We're constantly thinking about how to improve this. Um, this coming year, we're obviously going to take the, the short, the 15 in, in one semester, and we're going to spread those out over the whole year. The table and the sign will pop up, right? Pop up Tag Talks the day before the talk. Because instead of what is this and what's going on and who are you, we're starting to get, when's the next one going to be? So. Well, that will be the physical sign that there's going to be something there the next day. And we're going to start advertising specific talks. So this is going to be a shift from find the whole schedule here into specific speaker, the place and time. And you'll be able to see that on the monitors. And I've been continually talking with students and now with some lawyers in the community who are going to steal this idea. I borrowed it, but they're stealing it. <laughs> because they're trying, we don't have the um, explicit rule in the South Carolina legal ethics rules about technology, uh, the requirement to understand the risks and benefits of technology. That's not yet written into South Carolina's rules. Um, but there is a technology committee of the South Carolina Bar that foresees a day when that may happen. And so they're trying to get ready for that. 
and they're continually frustrated, much like we get frustrated about how hard it is to get this information to students. They're frustrated about, well, I say they, but I'm on the committee. <laughs> we are sometimes frustrated about how hard that message is to get to the lawyers. And uh, so they said, well, what about at the bar convention, instead of expecting people to come to one session to learn about technology when it competes with other sessions, what if we were in the hallway like the vendors, telling a tip here and a tip there? So I said, sure, you can have it. It can be hard. <laughs> Uh, some of them said they wanted to come to the law school and be part of our series, maybe to share with students, you know, what their desktop looks like at work and what tech they use. And we said, yes, come on, we love that. And maybe someday they will get back to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a student who's super excited about this. And when it comes to putting it on the schedule, maybe, maybe they will get back to me. Um, so it could happen. Anything could happen. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> Questions from now? How much trouble did you run into scheduling these ambushes? Because um, for, for my university, at least, to schedule a, even a spot in the hallway to table, it's, you have to give them notice. They need to get two or three days to get back to you. And you're competing with other people for space. So do you have any problems with that? Um, I don't look at them as problems, I look at them as opportunities. <laughs> so I took the opportunity to get myself trained on the software that typically you might think that only the, the um, staff assistants learn how to use, but I was like, I would like to go to that training, please, so I can schedule it. Um, that cleared one. Uh, burden. But yes, there is there is a whole process there. One thing we do is we use hallways that are not listed on that software. <laughs> um, another right. So another thing that we do is we actually have a meeting at the beginning of the semester where amongst ourselves we say where we're going to be and when, just tentatively. Um, if we check in with each other, we know we're not interfering with each other. Um, and then it means that, you know, those that are later in the semester have plenty of time to let folks know, to let them reserve the space, you know, it's all built in. Other questions? Yes. How much of your time was devoted to managing all of this? I mean, because it sounds fabulous, but I, how did you fit it in? Um, so, one thing that is good about being new in your career is you don't already have a lot of bites taken out of your time, so I just very quickly jumped on this and said I want to do this, so that, that helped. Um, and the fact is, Amy did so much, Gary did so much, I wasn't creating all of these talks. Everyone else said they wanted to do these things. And as you saw in that email that went out to everyone, everyone created their own handout. And they you know, came to the meeting, and within an hour or less, we had the whole schedule. So it's really that input from everyone else and just letting them do what they want. It put itself together. Patrick? Uh, Amy and Gary. Sorry, I think I have to direct my question. Um, when you started teaching tech skills, with the ones, the emails in the class, did you notice any like residual effects? Things you didn't intend to happen, like once you started teaching the one tech skill, there was like self-motivated learning in other areas, either in Word or any of the other things you were dealing with. I, I think you know what it was is that um, I knew early on, and just to let you know, our class started at a size of twelve, and we actually grew to twenty. Um, so we were actually into some of our class, and actually one student, you correct me if I'm wrong, Ramona, one student dropped this, this semester, and then immediately there was somebody on the wait list that came back in. So um, what we saw was that students would actually take the stuff they learned and, and did it in practice, and, and you know, I had a student, or like our first or second year, say, yeah, I actually took the Excel, and I'm actually doing stuff with, you know, for my firm, uh, creating seers with that. So we saw that they were like kind of being, um, you know, uh, advantageous with that. Um, I had one student like with the binders. He goes, 
Uh, I hope you don't mind. I did 44, you know, 49, excuse me, 49 instead of 39. <laughs> I like doing the article search. They were taking initiative to do that. Um, and uh, uh, that was really good to see. And, and seeing that they're actually interested in actually doing technology offers. So I, we definitely saw that people were, you know, um, I would say, you know, the interest was there and they actually took the next step. So in my context, I suppose, um, what I was surprised about was not that they dug more into finding other things to do in Word, but they would take what I was teaching them and applying it in other contexts that I didn't anticipate. So for example, their first assignment, they have to collaborate with a partner. So I give them the um, track changes and commenting feature tutorial for that so they can go back and forth. But then I started seeing them come to my office with their electronic copies and they had um, tracked their own changes and put comments in the margin, electronic comments in the margins for themselves. So they had adapted it for other purposes. And just to follow up on what you said, Patrick, we have a, we started a cybersecurity legal task force. And so we had an institute and two of the students volunteered in our class, volunteered to be you know, students for that, that institute for the uh, conference. Yes? This might be a little bit of a side tangent, but um, have you ever thought of maybe doing something similar to this um, uh, via Zoom or something like that during the summer? Um, I, and, and also, could you maybe remind me why the in-person <coughs> version of this is better than like a video or a web conference? Um, so the, you're referring specifically to these talks? Yeah, um, the, the ambush. The, so the idea of the ambush is, it's for the student who says, I cannot fit this into my schedule. Yeah. So if it was a, a video, if it were a webinar, that kind of thing, is the student who says, I don't have time for a webinar. Right. So they're literally walking down the hallway on their way to class. And they'll be saying that on the way, like, I don't have any time for this. And I just shove that hand out of their hand. That's, <laughs> That's why. <laughs> and then to follow up on that, we offer the LTAs to all students, faculty, and staff as part of our site license. It's exactly what he says. I mean, I will send reminders to say, hey, you have access to this. you have any questions, please let me know. It's the time factor of yeah. you know, doing it. Um, it's an interesting thought doing Zoom. I would be curious to see though if, how much, you know, interest in actually how many people would show up for that. It's you, the, the great thing about the ambush is it's a you know, brief minute or two, you know, if they don't have time to talk, they get the handout and, you know, I mean, one of the, one of, we do an IT support survey with students every, some, every spring and, you know, I don't get too many responses back as far as feedback. But one student said, I love the pop-up tech bar. So it was just like, I was like, yes, yes. So. I, um, I didn't want to say this, and I'm not going to tell you who they are, because um, I just don't want to call attention. But our registrar is in this room, and also one of the people from the law library uh, technical services that normally isn't a public-facing aspect. Uh, they are in this room learning about pop-up TED Talks because they're interested in potentially doing their own. So uh, thanks for being here, whoever you are. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, for Gary, could you talk specifically, I know you said they had put together the articles that they researched themselves, and are, are they, you requiring LTA stuff in your class? i uh, requiring them, that, yeah, the, the one requirement is to do the LTA in our class. The whole thing? Yes, the three, the Word, Excel, and Acrobat. Is there any other workload requirements that you have? Is there a final or anything? There's no final. It's the binder and that and class participation. Okay. Um, just to give you a heads up, uh, Dr. Adams has re retired. He was a faculty emeritus. Uh, we're hoping to have the class next spring with a certain alum, with actual alum of the class. We'll see what happens. And my guess is that we will probably restructure the class somewhere. to be a little more involved. How much time did you actually spend at the table? Did you schedule like half hour, an hour? Or did you come back to the table a couple of different times during the day? Um, so it varied. We were there once, so it was either morning or lunchtime. Uh, and then it was either an hour or an hour and a half. 
basically depending on how long we wanted to be there. I did the hour and a half for the one where we had the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Will you recycle all of the topics? Every two years, every three years? Your 1Ls will be there every year, but... So I, I hear a lot of planning in that, um, so it's a little more spontaneous than that. But we did say that we were going to recycle all of these topics because they are not only absolutely necessary for incoming 1Ls, but um, it's stuff that it doesn't hurt to hear again. And, and we may do a slightly different take on it, right? So like a different hook, but probably the same topic. How many times do you need to hear that you need to back up your computer here?